This morning, I am in the third week of a sermon series through 1 Thessalonians, which is a letter written by the Apostle Paul, one of the leaders of the early church, to a church in Thessalonica that he started around the year 49 AD. He got driven out of town by a mob of Jews who were not happy with him preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, and a couple of years later, he writes this letter to the church that he had started to remind them of the gospel, of his love for them, and to answer some questions that have come his way. And the last two weeks, we've looked at, first and foremost, the message that he shared, which he calls our gospel. And then we looked also at his relationship with them and the church, the vision he has for the church. The gospel, of course, is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that even though we've been separated from a holy God by our sins, that God loved us so much that he sent us son, his son, Jesus, to die on the cross in our place, to make a way for us to be restored to a right relationship with him, to have eternal life. God is the initiator of our faith. If we love, it's because he loved us first. If we believe, it's because he pursued us and revealed himself to us. And if we are going to grow in our faith, it's because of the initiative of the Holy Spirit. And then last week, we looked at God's vision for the church and what we learned in 1 Thessalonians 1, that the church would be a place where people are genuinely concerned for the welfare of others and where discipleship happens as we follow those worthy of imitation and live lives that are worthy of imitation. So this morning, we're going to read through 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the context, again, as you might rem remember, is that they were driven out of town by this angry mob. And once they left, of course, that angry mob spread all kinds of slander about Paul and who he was. And so in chapter 2, he spends some time defending his integrity and his love for them and reminding them again of the gospel. And he doesn't always do this. A lot of times he just kind of doesn't defend himself. But in this passage, he feels like he needs to defend himself because he doesn't want them to lose their faith. And so uh, he needs to assure them of his integrity and his devotion to them. So we're going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, nor from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to all men in their efforts to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they also heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person but not in thought, out of our intense longing we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. This is God's word. Let me pray before we continue. Father, help us to understand what this meant to the Thessalonians and what it means to us today. 
please reveal yourself to us. Help us to see you more clearly and to see ourselves more clearly as well as we meditate on your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, again, as I previously mentioned, Paul feels the need to defend himself. He doesn't always do this, but in this particular instance, he feels the need to defend, some, defend himself against these accusations and slander that have been leveled against him by this Jewish mob. And he pulls no punches in talking about them and how their opposition to the prophets and their opposition to him and the apostles. He says, God is not pleased with this. But when you look at his defense that he makes about himself, I want to summarize it quickly for you. What I see, he says, these are the accusations that they're making against him. Your visit was a failure. Your message is false. Your motives are not pure. You're trying to trick us. You're not from God. You're trying to please men. You're trying to flatter us. You're in this for the money. You just want people's praise. And you haven't returned because you don't care about us. It's a lot of accusations leveled against him. Can you imagine how you must feel as Paul, someone who's poured out his heart and his life for these people, and now this is what they're thinking about him because of all these messages that are shared about him. And so he responds to summarize his re response with this. He lets them know, we worked hard to earn our living, to not be a burden to you. We were gentle, caring for you like a mother of little children. We were holy, righteous, and blameless among you. We encouraged and comforted you like a loving father. We wanted to come, but we experienced spiritual opposition. And you are our glory and joy. This chapter brings up a really important issue that is not always expressed out in the open, but it's often right below the surface when it comes to not only church, but also to many relationships that we have, especially where there's any level of authority. That would be the issue of integrity, the issue of character. Look again at this list of accusations against Paul. Just read it to yourself. And again, look at how they are attacking his integrity, questioning his character. They're questioning whether his motives are pure. Does he really love them or is he in it for the money or for the praise? The message that he's speaking, is it true or is it just some thing that he's made up in order to take advantage of them? Again, this is one of those things that I think is not often expressed out loud, but is often underneath the surface for a lot of people. Some of you even today, maybe, as you're listening to my voice, are looking up here and saying, I'm not sure about this guy. Uh, can I trust what he's saying? Is he really pure in his motives, or is he in this for another reason? Again, I don't know if you're the type who's suspicious when it comes to authority figures in your life, or to pastors or spiritual leaders questioning whether they've got pure motives, right motives, or whether they're somehow trying to use you or take advantage of you. They're in it for something else, to gain the praise of people or to make a profit, to have power over people, to take advantage of people. Yes, there's often questions about the message, but more than that, there's often questions about the person delivering the message, right? Can I trust you? What are your motives really? Are you who you claim to be? Do you really believe the words that you're speaking? Does your life match your words? So again, this is not something that's always spoken out loud, but I believe that it's under the surface when it comes to many of our relationships, whether it's in church or outside the church, especially where there's any position of authority. It's this question, this suspicion, this doubt when it comes to motives and integrity and character. And it doesn't help the cause Every time a prominent pastor or leader falls into some kind of sin, disqualifies themselves from ministry, shows that their private life did not line up with their public life, whether it's a, someone out there in the you know, world that we listen to or watch or someone that we know personally, maybe someone whose church we attended. When they fall, it brings doubt and suspicion on all of us. And as I prepared this sermon, I certainly felt the weight of these questions, these accusations, the suspicions, the doubts. 
There's a quote by Robert Murray McShane that's particularly poignant to me. He says this, my people's greatest need is my personal holiness. He said that as a pastor, just bring it to mind. More than skill, more than any other talents or abilities, it's about personal holiness. It's about character. It's about integrity. That that's most important. But the thing about integrity and character, it's not just for pastors, it's not just for spiritual leaders, it's for anyone, especially anyone in any position of authority, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a boss. Questions of integrity and character are part of every relationship. Are you who you claim to be? Do you really believe the words you're saying? Does your private life match your public life? Does your life match your words and your thoughts? Can you be trusted? And you could fool people for a while with techniques, with methods, with games, but in the end, your character and your integrity are going to show through, or your lack thereof. And that's why this passage, I think, is so essential to focus on this morning and to ask the question about integrity and character. Because there's four things in particular from this passage I want to focus on about what we learn about how to live with integrity as a Christian. The first thing that I see is this. Live to please God. If you want to be a person of integrity, live to please God. Go back to verse 3 through 6, and let's read this again. For the appeal that we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery nor did we put on a mask to cover up our greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. See how clearly there he's letting them know, I'm not living for the praise of men. I'm not looking to please you. God is my witness. I'm living to please him. And you want to be a person of integrity. First and foremost, live your life to please God. Because often the issue of integrity comes down to the question of who are you when no one is looking, right? It's one thing to put on a show in front of people, but who are you when no one is looking? And the answer to that question often depends upon whether or not you think there is a God who is looking when no one else is looking, right? Who are you when no one is looking? Do you believe that there is a God who is looking even when no one else is looking? Who knows your thoughts? Who knows what you do in secret? And I don't mean to say this like Santa Claus, right? He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake, right? It's not about fear of punishment. That's not what we're talking about here. There's a Latin phrase that, that sums this up well. It's the phrase quorum Deo, which means to live your life in God's face, in God's presence, under his authority for his glory. It's a great phrase that we are to live our lives quorum Deo, recognizing that whatever we do, we are doing it in his presence, under his authority, for his glory, that God is omnipresent. And again, I'm not saying this to scare you, right, out of fear of punishment. What I'm saying is that when you believe the gospel, when you've been saved by Jesus, when you belong to him, when you see the love that he has for you, then you want to live your life to please him, to honor him. And that becomes your primary goal in life is to honor him, to live your whole life, quorum Deo, in his presence, under his authority, to bring him glory. Whether you are in front of people or by yourself, whatever you think, whatever you do, or as Paul says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So whether or not someone is watching you, you live your life before God because you know he is always watching you and you live your life accountable to him, to please him. I remember one time having a conversation with someone who was not a believer and somehow I got on the topic of how I love God more than I love my wife. And they didn't understand that. and said, well, doesn't that make your wife jealous that she's not the one you love the most? And the answer is no, that I love my wife better if I love God more than I love her, if I'm living my life to please God and not to please her. 
Because when God's my first love, I'm not going to heap unrealistic expectations on her that only God can meet. And more importantly, when I feel like she does not deserve my love and respect, he still deserves my respect. And he deserves that I treat her with honor, with love. Right? If you think that you should just treat people based on what they deserve, then how do you find the strength to love someone when you feel like they're unlovable? Respect someone you feel like they don't deserve respect. But if God is the one you are living to please, then you can love people who are unlovable. You can respect people and treat people with respect even when you feel like they don't deserve it. Because you're not living to please others. You're living to please him first and foremost. So who are you when no one is looking? Depends upon whether you think there's a God who's looking when no one else is looking. If you want to be a person of integrity and character, live your life first and foremost to please God. Coram Deo. In his presence. For his glory. Second thing we see from this passage about how to live with integrity is to love people and not use them. Let's go back to verses 6 through 12. Paul says, We're not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are our witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. If you want to be a person of integrity, pay attention to your relationships. And whether you are loving people or using people, whether you are in it for their good or you are in it for what they can do for you. And in this passage, Paul likens himself to both a mother and a father, which is really interesting. In this one passage, he says, we loved you like a mother. We loved you like a father. And when you think about a healthy relationship between a parent and a child, parents do not have children, at least most parents, I would guess, do not have children because of what they can do for them, right? You're not having a child because you're saying, I want to have a child who will serve me, who will do for me. Most parents recognize that it is a very one-sided relationship that I am going to give I'm going to love, I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to serve, and I'm not going to count the cost. I'm not going to keep score. Because being a parent is not about using, it's about loving. It's about what I can do for you, how I can care for you. And so he uses this analogy, I think he says, because that's what my relationship was like with you, Thessalonians. I'm not, I'm not in this to use you. It's, in fact, he says, I worked very hard not to be a burden to you. We worked day and night not to be a burden to you. We earned our own living. We didn't take money from you. We loved you like a parent loves a child. If you want to be a person of integrity, be very careful to make sure you're not using people for what they can do for you, that you're not in relationships just because it's transactional and you want them to do for you, but you're in it because you love people and you want to serve like God has served you. Now, I'm not as strong as Paul. I do take a salary from this church. I don't work day and night the way Paul did to make sure he wasn't a burden. But I do make a point of making sure I don't look at what people give. The treasurer takes care of that. Because I don't ever want that to be a factor in my relationship with people in the church, right? That I treat people differently because one person's a big donor, right? Or some person isn't. I don't want that to be a factor in my integrity and character as a pastor, or to treat people differently based on how they serve or what they do. If you want to be a person of integrity, check your relationships to see if you are loving people or if you're using people. Because the world is full of people who are using you, right? There's plenty of people out there who are using you for their own gain and using others for their own gain. That they're in relationships for what they can get out of it. 
showing attention to people so that they will get money or business or attention or sex or influence or service using people for what they can get out of them. People who connect with you because of what you can do for them, how you can further their career. They're using you for their own personal gain. And when you're no longer of use to them, they will quickly end the relationship and find someone else who they can use for their own personal gain. But it's not to be that way with the gospel, with followers of Jesus, that if you want to be a person of integrity and character, that you don't use people, but you love them and you serve them. You're willing to sacrifice for the good of others. Paul ends this passage by saying this, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. You're our reward, in other words. I'm not using you to gain some other reward. You are our reward. Your relationship, seeing you right with God, growing in your faith, that is my reward. I'm not in this to use you for some personal gain. I'm in it to serve you and love you for your own good. So, in this passage, again, there's four things I want to point to about having living lives of integrity. The first was this, live to please God. Not to please others, but live your life quorum Deo. Secondly, love people, don't use them. And then thirdly, live openly with others. In other words, be open and honest. Do not live hiding, do not live in the darkness, but be open, live your life openly with others. In verse eight, going back again, he says, we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. And if you want to live a life of integrity, be careful that you're not walking in the darkness and living in the shadows and hiding, but that you are willing to live your life openly in front of at least one other person that you trust. In this passage, Paul repeats the phrase, you know, a lot. In defense of these slanderous accusations, he says, you know how we lived among you. You know we didn't use flattery. You know how we treated you. You know how we loved you. He's saying, we lived openly. You saw how we lived. Don't listen to these lies. You know our hearts. You know our actions. You know who we are. He can defend himself because he lived openly. He lived honestly. He didn't hide. He didn't walk in the darkness. In 1 John 1, 6 through 7, John writes, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we walk in the light, we walk with God and we walk with each other. Instead of walking in the darkness, instead of hiding in the shadows, we're open about our lives, our sin, our struggles. If you want to be a person of integrity, don't walk in the darkness, but walk openly in the light. James 5.16 tells us, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. If you want to be a person of integrity, you cannot do this alone. You cannot live your life keeping your sin, keeping your struggles to yourself. We're all tempted in many ways. We all keep veering away from God towards self-centeredness, towards sin. And you need to live your life openly and honestly with at least someone you trust that you can confess to. I'm not saying you just broadcast your struggles to everybody because not everyone can be trusted. But you need to find someone, at least one person that you trust, who you can be open and honest with. If you want to live a life of integrity and character, first and foremost, live to please God. Because he's looking when no one else is looking. Love people. Don't use them. Watch out in your relationships that you're not using people for your own selfish personal gain. And then thirdly, live openly with others. And then lastly, I'd say this. Make the gospel your life's message. Make the gospel your life's message. Verse 13, he says, We also thank God continually because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, 
but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. It's not just about how we live, but also about the message that we preach, the message that we share. Paul uses the Greek word for herald, caruso, in this passage to describe what his role is. And a herald, if you didn't know what a herald was in those days, the herald would take a message from the king and would bring it to the subjects and would proclaim it. And the job of the herald was to, word for word, repeat the message the king had given him. And it's a great message for what the job of the pastor, the preacher, the evangelist is. To not change the message, to not alter the message in any way, but to be faithful to the gospel message that the king has given. Because that's my job, I'm a herald. It's not up to me to embellish it, to add to it, to change it, to make it something that makes it more attractive in any way, but to just preach the gospel. I mean, did you ever wonder, looking back at Paul and the early church, how they were able to build the church the way they did to see so many people converted? And they didn't have Instagram. They didn't have branding back then. They didn't have smoke machines. They did not have someone playing the keyboard quietly behind them while they gave the altar call. They didn't have any of that. And somehow, somehow, the church grew. Somehow people were converted without all of those things. Maybe, just maybe, there's power in the gospel, right? Maybe, just maybe, there's power in the message that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that all who trust in him will have eternal life, all guilt, all shame forgiven, a right relationship with God, the power of God in their lives. Maybe, just maybe, there is power in that. That it doesn't have to be dressed up. We don't have to use any manipulation or tricks or anything else. Maybe, as the writer of Hebrews said, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. (coughs) It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Let me let you in on a little secret here as a pastor. I've done this long enough to know that if you want to grow a church, the fastest way to grow a church is to preach a health and wealth gospel, right? If I preached a message that said that God wants you to be rich and God wants you to be healthy and that if you just believe strong enough, right, have enough faith that you'll get that promotion and you'll get that wealth, And every sickness will go away. Every illness will be healed. The church will grow because that is the message people want to hear. They want to hear that there is a God out there who will bring them wealth and bring them health. But that's not the gospel, is it? That's not what we read here. We Again, go back to what Paul said in in chapter 2, verse 2. He said, we previously suffered and had been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. He was kicked out of Philippi, and then he was driven out of Thessalonica as well. And he kept preaching the gospel, and instead of finding health and wealth coming his way, instead it was suffering and strong opposition. But he never stopped preaching the gospel, and God blessed that. And he saw the church grow and many converted despite the suffering, despite the strong opposition. Make the gospel your life's message. Again, you want to live a life of integrity. You want to be a, someone who shares the faith with integrity, preaches the gospel with integrity. Don't add to it. Don't dress it up. Don't try to make it more attractive. Just preach the gospel. Share the good news of Jesus Christ in his life, death, and resurrection pays the penalty for our sins that makes us right with God. Preach the gospel of eternal life. Because more and more, I think people can see through manipulation and sales tactics, right? I mean, we've been advertised to so much, haven't we? By this time, I think we can smell it a mile away when someone is trying to manipulate us and trick us and sell us on something. The 
gospel is that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that everything you've ever done wrong, past, present, and future, that he died to pay the penalty for that on the cross, in your place. That is the depth of God's love for you, that he does not want you to be separated from him from all eternity, but he wants you to know him, to have his power by his Holy Spirit in you, to have eternal life. And that is good news because here I am preaching a message on integrity and character. And many of you, I'm sure, are hearing this and saying, well, I don't feel like a person of integrity. And I don't feel like a person of character all the time. And I know that I've blown it. And I know that people look at my life and I've fallen short. I've hurt people with my lack of integrity, my lack of character. The things I do in secret, I'm not pleased, I'm not proud of. The person I am in private doesn't always match who I am in public. The things that I'm thinking right now, the things that I'm thinking in my life, don't match up with the way a person of God should be. That's why the gospel is such good news. Because in the end, it's not about your integrity that saves you. It's not your character that saves you, right? It's his integrity. The, it's the integrity of Jesus Christ, who was without sin, who lived perfectly the life that we couldn't live. It's his integrity that saves us. It's his character that saves us. It's putting our trust in him and not our trust in our own integrity and character. Again, going back to 1 John chapter 1. He writes, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's grace for all of us doesn't matter how far short you have fallen from a life of integrity and character. There's forgiveness for you. There's grace that covers all of our sins in Jesus Christ. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Integrity matters. Your character matters. Whether you are a spiritual leader or not, whether you are a parent or not, it matters in friendships, it matters in relationships, it matters at work. You want to be a person of integrity and character. First and foremost, live your life, quorum Deo, to please God in his sight. Because even when no one else is looking, he is looking. Live your life to honor him. Make the gospel your message Make the gospel your message, the forgiveness that we find in Jesus Christ. Love people, don't use them. Make sure in your relationships that you're not manipulating others, but you're living to serve them. And don't go it alone. Can I encourage you, please, be honest with at least one person. If this is brought up in your mind, areas of your life that you know are out of character, out of step with the integrity that you want to live, then confess your sins to someone that they may pray for you, that you may be healed. Walk in the light. Be open and honest with someone you trust that you might be a person of integrity. Let me pray, and the worship team is going to come forward, and we'll respond in worship. <coughs> Father, first and foremost, we confess to you our sins. Why don't you take just some time right now between you and the Lord and just confess anything that is on your heart that you need to confess to him. Lord, we thank you for that promise that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for that promise that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Thank you for the gospel, that there is salvation there's forgiveness, there's eternal life, that we can have you 
in us by the Holy Spirit. Transform us, Lord, into people of integrity and character. That our lives might match our words and our thoughts. Help us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Drive out anything that is not of you, that anything that is not in line with your character. Make us into people of integrity, we pray, for your sake, for your gospel, for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.